Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Tom Whipple. I'm the science editor at The Times and I would love to welcome you to the 2022 Festival of Politics organised by the Scottish Parliament. This year's event celebrates the festival's 18th year of provoking, inspiring and informing people of all ages and from every walk of life to engage in three days of spirited debate. We are delighted that you can join us today to participate in a very timely uh, session, The Climate Crisis Hasn't Gone Away. And I would like to encourage you to use the question and answer box to introduce yourselves, stating your first name only and geographical location, and then pose any questions you would like the panel to respond to. If you're keen to continue to throw your thoughts out there, you can do so using the hashtag hash FOP2022. I am extremely pleased to be joined today by Dr. Keith Bell, Lucy Stanfield Jenner, and Zarina Ahmed. Dr. Keith Bell is a co director of the UK Energy Research Centre, a chartered engineer, and a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Lucy Stanfield Jenner is an environmental scientist and professional working to drive the transition to a circular net zero economy. And Zarina Ahmad is one of the mighty women on BBC Women's Hour's 2020 Our, Power, Our Planet Power List. Zarina previously worked at the Council for Ethnic Minority Voluntary Organisations, leading the charge for increasing participation in environmentalism in Scotland by founding, founding the Ethnic Minority Environmental Network. There will be opportunities for the members of the online audience to put questions and views to the panel throughout this event. However, to start, I would like to open by asking each of our panellists, starting with Zarina and then going on to Lucy and finally Keith. Um, when, we, when we organised this panel, we didn't know it was going to be quite amid the environment in the UK, certainly in the south of the UK that we're seeing now. Given the unprecedented heatwave warnings and danger to life in the UK and wildfires across Europe issued in July, is this a tipping point? Are the public governments, those in power across the globe, finally paying attention and saying, you know, climate change is real and we need to get real? Zarina, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I would say definitely. I mean, I think what's happened now is that people's lives are being disrupted. It's costing government, it's costing corporations. So people are now standing up and thinking, oh, we have to do something. No, this is affecting us now. This is us in the UK. This is us in the global West. But we do have to remember that people in the global South and in developing countries have been impacted by climate change for a number of years. And governments and people there and civil society have been there have been screaming and shouting that we've been impacted by climate change. You know, let's do something. And where that's been ignored, and it's only now that it's hitting us in the UK that we're starting to feel it that we are now thinking we need to do something. So for me, it's, it's great, but it's also a shame that it's taken this, uh, the current climate and the current environment that we're in for us to stand up and start doing something. Lucy, Lucy, what do you think? Is this, we've spent sort of, I think most of our lives talking about climate change as being a coming threat. Is it now a, an arrived threat? Uh, and is this the moment when things really start to happen? Yes, I certainly spent the entirety of my life kind of talking about this. Um, I, I do think we have reached a tipping point, both in terms of the environmental disasters that we're seeing, but both, you know, in terms of people's response to it as well. Climate change is now the chief concern for voters in the UK across the political spectrum, even more so than COVID. So people know that it's a threat. They, they want the government to do more than they are doing on it. As Zarina said, we need to remember that we're seeing these disasters now in the summer in the global north. Of course, the global south has been living with the realities of climate change for much longer than that. So I, th I think we need to kind of make sure that we, we recognize that. But certainly, yeah, we're, we're starting to see more action on it. The US is just, uh, well, close to passing a, a phenomenal bill. Um, so hopefully, we're kind of getting there. Um, and hopefully, it won't be too late. What I am a bit concerned about is, is people starting to feel that it's that it is too late and feeling overwhelmed with, with the threats that we are seeing with the wildfires, with the heat waves, with droughts, feeling like we can't do anything about it because that isn't true. Um, and we need to make sure that denial doesn't slip into anxiety and, and, and kind of giving up. Thank, thank you, Lucy. Keith, what are your thoughts? I think that's a really great point by Lucy about you know, 
not not giving up and not not being too despondent at the things that seem to be going wrong. Um, I mean, I think we've had a lot of tipping points. Apparently, you know, we talked in this country about COP26 and, and the coming of the UN Climate Change Conference in Glasgow being a great tipping point. It was a fantastic kind of platform for engaging with uh, climate issues. Uh, but we've had, you know, severe summers before that. You know, previously that this this year is is the, is the worst. Uh, certainly in, in this country and for many parts of Europe, but we've had we've had bad ones before, and we seem to remember then. Then, unfortunately, we, we seem to forget, and it's sort of um, similar in other other parts of the world. You know, the, uh, I think it was a couple of years ago, the summer in Australia, lots of uh, forest fires, disruption. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago in, in California, in, in Canada, it seemed to be a kind of big momentum. People realizing this this is this is real. This is this is now, and then. Somehow, political will uh, seeping away again. Hopefully, though, what we see is a, is a general ratcheting up of awareness and commitment to action. Even if there's a period when it seems to get forgotten and other sort of political priorities take over, but there's still an underlying trend towards realizing that this is, as Lucian Zarina was saying, this this is serious and it's it's happening right now, and uh, we, we've got to do the best we can to mitigate any further temperature rise, but we've also got to be adapted. The temperature rise, it is already happening. It, it, it's sort of un, unavoidable, unfortunately, but to limit it so that it's not completely disastrous. Thank you very much, Keith. Um, all, all four of us were at, at some points and in different parts at the COP conference in Glasgow um, late last year. Um, and we, we were discussing before this, I think it's safe to say it is a an, an exceptionally confusing um, uh, system, um, as, as almost certainly it needs to be, and the negotiation is very hard to follow. Um, and inevitably, as, as a journalist, certainly you're trying to draw slightly simpler messages out of this. But one of the messages at the end, um, Alok Sharma, Britain's president for COP26, said he, he was deeply sorry for how the conference concluded. Um, there were last minute changes in the text which uh, watered down agreements to phase out the use of coal. Um, what do you think, uh, starting with Keith, what, what, what do you think about his assessment of those final agreements? Was, was um, COP26 disappointing? I think it wasn't as good as we hoped it would be, and not as good as Alok Sharma hoped it would be. But it, on the other hand, it wasn't as bad as it might have been. So there were some positives in there. So, for example, just mentioning coal in that, in that uh, you know, pact at all, is, is progress relative to what we've what we've had in the past. Um, I think another significant bit of progress was, you know, kind of, there's a whole lot of stuff around the kind of Paris rule book, which I don't understand either, but I mean, that's, that's a, you know, a major achievement. Um, but I think one of the big things was the recognition that the nationally determined contribution, and this was a disappointing thing, don't add up to what we need to limit temperature rise to one and a half degrees C. But on the other side, that there was there was a commitment to come back this year, COP27, give updated nationally determined these you know emissions reduction targets for 2030. Previous uh, kind of you know, what what Paris Agreement had said was you come back and you do this every five years. So the fact of coming back next year, hopefully to come up with something better, was it was a positive outcome. I mean on the negative side, since then I think I think we've only seen Australia. Making a, making a statement that yes, they're going to do better, they're going to come up with, a, with an improved N NDC. Uh, so there's, there's still some time yet, so there was a kind of flurry for COP26 of announcements you know, to do with you know, net zero targets and so on. So yeah, let, let's hope let's hope we get a similar flurry of good news uh, in the run up to, uh, to, to November. Yeah, yeah. L Lucy, what, what are your thoughts on, I guess, the the legacy of COP26, and, and do you think any progress has been made since on those, those pledges? How would you sum, sum the whole thing up? The COP26, um, as, as Keith said, it wasn't uh, as good as we could do, but it wasn't as bad as we have done previously at COPs. And I, I think if we didn't have COP, we would invent COP. We're trying to get an extremely difficult thing to happen, which is to get hundreds of countries to completely change the way their economies have run and do it quickly. So it's the best mechanism that we have, even if it is a flawed mechanism. One of the legacies I think of COP26 will be 
leadership that the UK has shown, and I know that there are concerns and disappointment about what's currently going on on our country's leadership on climate change. Nonetheless, I do think COP26 was was good to demonstrate that. Another thing that I experienced, I, I was there in, in my capacity as, as the former chair of a, a youth-led charity, and it was a lot more democratised than previous COPs have been. There were a lot more different groups there that aren't normally there. There was a lot more effort to kind of explain what was going on. And I think that's really important too. These are decisions that are going to impact all of our lives. So it's really great to see that wider level of engagement. In terms of progress since then, absolutely. There's progress happening every minute of every day on climate change. It's just not always making the headlines. And there isn't, what 1.5 degrees is, is a science-based target and it's very important. However, there isn't a kind of black or white, the world is over or it's not. It, it's it's uh it's very nuanced um and it exists on a spectrum so it, it's not kind of all this talk around we have 12 years to save the world is very damaging i believe and and so i think it's important to recognize that just because it's not necessarily in the headlines every day there are thousands of people around the world working on climate change every single day so yes definitely since cop 26 we have made progress yeah I should add, so I was as a journalist we were given daily briefings on background by the negotiators and from the start, from the, those words about coal appearing on the document, the negotiator's view was they would go. Like they, they, they were there, that something that sort of existed so that in the final text something something could be jettisoned. Um, it, I mean, it was a, a simultaneously fascinating and um, slightly depressing process. I, I remember one day everything hinged on this list of adjectives that you have as whether whether something is immediately or very or there's this approved hierarchy of, of terms and it was about swapping out a very for a, a fourth whiff or something but um Zarina as someone who was slightly outside the process uh, and and on the, the fringe events and not part of the minutiae of all of these different clauses and sub clauses how, how did it look to you well I suppose it goes back to what Keith was saying that there was positives, um, however, the the negatives, I suppose, from like looking at it from just the general public's point of view, is probably the greenwashing that was happening, and it really felt that there was a lot of greenwashing that a lot of like organisations and corporations were seeing that they are doing things when we know they're not, and it's just being greenwashed. Um, you know, even things around like Glasgow City city itself, it all of a sudden became this green city. And you're thinking, well, nothing's really changed from what it was like last week, and now we're a green city. What's happened? You know, yes, you're right. There are small changes, like electrification of the vehicles or by the buses. However, that's my worry, is like how much of the pledges and the things that are happening at that higher level are just greenwashing and how much of it is about economics and growth, but in a sector that's not going to have an impact on everyday life and everyday people. And that's where my worry lies and my concerns lie and that anxiety comes in, as Lucy was saying. Yeah. Um, no, uh, the, the, I mean, one of the things that was, again, sort of part of the negotiation process, you pull yourself out, you think, oh, that's slightly absurd. But one of the, the things, as I understand it, that was agreed at the end of the COP26 was to make more agreements at COP27. And actually, that was quite a significant thing. Um, do you think, Lucy, that, that, you know, what do you hope to be achieved at Sharm El Sheikh uh, when they do appear for COP27? Um, big question. I think the main thing for me is, um, as Keith mentioned before, the nationally determined contributions reporting. As Keith said, it, I believe it is only Australia that has kind of reported on that so far. And so I think that it, we, it would be a concern if we didn't see that happening at, at Sharm El Sheikh. Um, that was one of the, in my, in my mind, that was one of the biggest kind of positive leaps forward that we made at COP26. And so it would be a shame to backslide on that. Um, other than that, I mean, <laughs> my general hope for every COP is that there is progress that can be measured. I think we have moved away from the days where we ca the, the conferences ended in, in nothing really happening. Um, I know there was the hope for Glasgow to kind of be the Glasgow Pact to be on the same level as the Paris Agreement, and it wasn't. But maybe this year we can get an Egypt Agreement or an Egypt Pact or whatever they want to call it. Um, but something that is genuinely moving us forwards. 
The other thing that I would like to see, and it seems more likely to happen, is the US taking a more leading role. I know that there's criticism of the way that the, the bill has been has been watered down, but that is the reality of negotiations and the reality of, of kind of getting these things to happen. But I think with the assumption that that bill will pass, then the US taking a, a more leading role again um, and, uh, and, and, and decarbonizing their economy showing that that way forward and showing that a large and complicated country like the us can do it um i, I think that would be a, that would be a fantastic outcome yeah yeah by the way for, for those watching um thank you please keep your questions coming in there's going to be a few more minutes of me asking questions and then we'll hopefully have accumulated enough from you that, that it'll be entirely thrown open to the floor um keith on on sharmil sheikh what, what 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 are your hopes for it yeah, I would agree agree with Lucy about you know the, the NDCs, these nationally determined contributions, the 2030 emission reduction targets. Uh, and you know, it, it's great that the US in a way is kind of back in the game. Uh, although one of the other big issues that I think is going to come up, and it was you know raised by lots of the sort of lower income countries, COP26, and it's still of course, very much on the agenda, is this is this topic that's kind of described as loss and damage. So uh, you know, the, the kind of attempt to, to be able to do something, get help with the impacts of climate change that are already happening. So, you know, I mean, it's not just the sort of extreme events like, like you know, storms or, or floods. Uh, it's also the kind of, you know, sort of slow impacts where, you know, sea levels are rising and gradually over time you realise you've got to move neighbourhoods in different places or impacts on, on the type of agriculture that's sustainable as the weather gets, gets hotter or drier. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it seems like a, you know, it, it is a massively important topic. But my understanding is that the US in particular is one of the parties quite resistant to getting this on the agenda, on the formal agenda of, of, of COP27. Uh, and I, I suppose uh, that's, that's because, you know, the US is one of the, the heavily industrialized economies, like, like, like most of us in Europe, uh, who's been, yeah, causing uh, greenhouse uh, gas emissions or decades you know for 100 150 years you know so we have we have a legacy really of, of large you know playing a large part in creating these impacts so there is this kind of tension in terms of the action that really does need to be taken but finance that needs to be put in place to help to support that i guess a nervousness about um, the extent to which you know, the industrialized economies are kind of somehow sort of held to account for past misdemeanors I and mean, indeed current misdemeanors they're still major emitters. Yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, I, I've been going to conferences since Copenhagen, um, which I think makes me, I don't know, middle-aged in climate terms. Um, and the big, and this is simply a vibe, I don't have any, um, you know, data for it at all. My feeling at Copenhagen was that the governments were trying to drag business along. Whereas at Glasgow, it felt far more like business was slightly dragging governments along, saying, "Look, give us these parameters. You know, t tell us what 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 what's needed, and we can find ways to do it." Um, to what extent? Um, I'll, ask, I'll ask this of Zarina first. You, who who is it who has a responsibility here? Um, you know, we're, we're talking a lot about a government process, but is is it is it multinationals? Is it individual people? You know, we we all sort of say, "Oh." Fossil fuel companies are bad, but you know we're, we're busily trying to heat our homes this, this winter. Who who is it who should be dealing with this? Well, I think it's everybody, but I do worry that when we put it onto individual, that we have to realise that individuals have limited agency. You know, and um, people say that you know individual choices can change consum con you know consumption demand, and that's what markets um, that you know how the market works because if there's demand, there's supply. However, I just think in the society that we live in, as an individual, we do have limited choices. We do have limited agency, right? So I think that that narrative about behaviour change has to shift because I think there's too much pressure on individual change. So, and I think we do have to look at as a system as a whole, rather than looking at things in silo. And I think we need this whole reform of what our consumption behavior and patterns are, but that's including economics, it's including policies, including industry. So it's including everybody in that. And, and for me, one of the things that I really want to see change at COP27 
is putting people at the centre of climate change, because at the moment, the conversations aren't around people and it's all around the planet. But if we start looking at how people and other inhabitants of the planet are affected by COP20, by, by climate change, we would have a different conversation. You know, it's putting justice at the heart of it and connecting climate change to social justice is really important. And I think that's where that shift has to happen because otherwise it's so easy to just think of things in silos and work, especially when we're looking at net zero and we're just looking at how do we get to net zero. And, and in that transition, we're actually maybe doing more damage because we're so in a rush to get to net zero that we're actually having a negative impact on other on people's lives and on the livelihood of inhabitants on the planet. So I think we need to start thinking more holistically. Uh, Lucy, you were nodding for a bit during that. What, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I, um, I, I was nodding mainly because I agree that we have put far too much emphasis on individual responsibility. Um, and we see the same thing happen in other topics, you know, individual responsibility to be more fit and, you know, tackle the obesity crisis by just eating more healthily. Like that's a simple, a simple uh, option that people can choose. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it, individual responsibility has been used as a scapegoat. Um, but however, the answer is everything in life and on climate change is not one thing or the another. It's, it's we need government policy that makes our lives naturally greener. So, for example, investing in homegrown renewable energy, in nuclear, in my opinion, in an electric vehicle um, infrastructure. But we also need um, businesses to lead the way on it as well. And, and you know, I, I, I work in the circular economy and we need to make it easier for businesses to make a more circular and sustainable choice. At the moment, the linear economy of taking a resource, making it into something, and then often only using it once and throwing it away is the most economically viable thing to do. But that's because we're not costing in the negative externalities of environmental damage. So it, it needs everyone to kind of come along. But yes, I absolutely agree that um, asking, expecting individuals to change um, is, is not going to get us all the way there. It definitely will help. And we definitely shouldn't be doing some of our most environmentally damaging things that we do. But it's not going to be the whole picture. I guess the final thing I'll, I'll just say on the kind of individual question is that we currently glamorize really high fossil fuel lifestyles. So we look up to people on TV who are icons of fast fashion. We admire celebrities who take private flights uh, you know, all around the world. Um, Bill Gates, massive proponent of uh, climate action, but was recently in trouble for taking a nine minute flight from San Diego to Los Angeles. So, you know, we, we, we glamorize that kind of lifestyle and we need to kind of think about as a society, what lifestyle we want to admire and, and, and kind of who those role models should be. Um, and so I think in terms of kind of individual behavior change, that that's something that we, we can do. Um, but yes, I think mainly my, my focus, we'd be pushing it onto the kind of large businesses and government policy. Um, so you, you mentioned, Lucy, that there's the circular economy. Um, what is what is going wrong? Yeah, as I understand it, you think there's, to a large extent, this is an incentives problem as well as anything else. Um, what, what's going on and what, what can be done? So a, a circular economy, I'm sure a lot of people here will, will know, will have heard about it and will kind of know the basics of what it is. But essentially, it's, it's a model where you design out waste and you treat everything with a with a value. So as I said, at the moment, our economy is built on a linear model where you, you take something and say um, a natural resource out the ground and you build it into something, let's say a mobile phone, you use that for some time and then you throw it away. Or even worse, perhaps it's the lid of a yogurt pot, you use it once and it gets thrown away. And often it goes into landfill or it gets burnt. In a circular economy, that waste is minimized. So those models are kind of thought about from the beginning about how you can design out that waste and make it a more of a, a closed loop. And I really believe that a circular model is really important to tackling a lot of the problems that we're talking about here. We know that the leading cause of biodiversity loss is the way that we use our land and our harmful um, processes of, of extracting materials and disposing of them. We know that um, manufacturing construction is a large emitter of carbon and, um, and other greenhouse gases. So thinking, going back to the start and thinking, how do we actually design our products and our services to minimize that waste and, and waste, including not just a physical thing, but also um, greenhouse gas emissions too, um, it, it is really important. And it's not easy because I, as I said, currently there's no incentive to work on that model. I ran my own circular business for a while and 
it was just as um, expensive for me to kind of deal with um, tax and all, all the kind of things that are involved in running a business as it was for a linear model. There was no um, incentive for me to be greener. And actually, my expenses were higher because I maintained a, um, ownership over my products. So that meant that I would fix it and repair it rather than um, the customer relying on the customer to dispose of it sustainably. But there was no incentive for me to do that other than because I thought it was a good thing to do. So we need to be talking about how we can give tax cuts or um, other incentives to, to, to businesses who adopt these models. Keith, from a um, energy perspective, is is the input here? My sort of naive technotopia view of all of this kind of thing is: you solve the energy problem, you find a way to get very cheap, very clean energy, you know, fusion or whatever, and everything else falls into place. You can you can chuck whatever energy you need at all of these other problems, and uh, job's done. Yeah, well, if you've got low carbon sources of energy, that's a, that's a, a, an essential. You know, we're exactly where they are. Options, I mean, Lucy outlined one or two there, and you, you've made that fusion is always 30 years away, you know, and, you know, or, or whatever it is. But um, it's not the whole story because it's it's still got to be paid for somehow. There's an investment in making that, that transition of the, of the way energy is produced. But there's also a need to be able to use it in a different way. So uh, to have, you know, 100% uh, uh, low carbon electricity is great, but it doesn't help an awful lot if we're still burning gas to eat our homes or we're still burning you know, petrol and diesel to, to you know, move around. So the way we use energy has got to change as well as the way we produce energy. And that's, uh, that's one of the big challenges now. And you know, coming back to you know, what we were talking about just a few minutes ago, Marina was talking about you know, uh, in, individuals and, and the great point that it depends on having the option available to you and for it to be kind of an accessible option. So one of those uh, one of those options, for example, is, is to be able to heat your home using a heat pump. So how, how easy is it to do that? How much does it cost to make that conversion? How disruptive is it? Do you know who to go and talk to to make it make it happen? So in this country, it's not easy at the moment. It ought to be easy. You know, there's nothing fundamental about the technology that says it can't work. It's you know it's used in other countries, you know, very widespread. So uh, there's nothing fundamental. We need to get somehow get them get the market going. You know, and lose experience from trying to get a business going in the circular economy, you know, it's, it's not always, it's not always easy. Um, so there is that role then for government, for setting the, the, the context and the incentives, helping to make sure that there are, there is encouragement and support for individuals to go and kind of retrain, um, you know, uh, an experienced, you know, knowledgeable fitter of these sorts of, uh, sorts of uh, appliances. Um, making sure that over time the cost does come, yes, creates a market, the cost will come down. But in the meantime, it is difficult for householders, especially if you've not got much you know, capital behind it, to, to make, make these changes. So the role of the government is, I think, to make it easy, use kind of government instruments to do that, but also to set these targets and objectives very clearly, very firmly. That's one of the things I think that has influenced you know, it's been the growth in electric vehicles over the last few years. The market is responding to it. But it's in large part because governments UK and other countries have said, right, you know, we're phasing out sale of fossil fuel vehicles by 2030 or whatever it is. And we very clear direction of travel then. Yeah, yeah. Um, as we, at the beginning, I think we, we talked about how, you know, in, in the UK and in Western Europe, we're now clearly experiencing um, the effects of climate change. We, I think we, we smashed England's record for its hottest day by two degrees this, this year, almost two degrees. Um, Zarina, the the latest IPCC report though warns that actually you know the, the it's the people and ecosystems who are least able to cope who are being hardest hit. Um, given that it's happening now, what what do you think should be done to protect and uh, support these people and ecosystems? Um, it's going back to what Keith was talking about, loss and damage. So is that finance to help and support? For, um, those developing countries, because most of them are developing countries, not all, but there are a lot of developing countries that are hardest hit by the climate impact. And it's, it's helping those to then put in the infrastructure to do the climate adaptation that they need to do. Now, my only worry, I mean, with loss and damage, this is about um, compensation money, but there's also climate finance, which was a COP26, which was pledged by a number of countries from developing countries to the more underdeveloped countries. Now, 
my worry there is that that climate finance isn't always a grant it's a loan so when we talk about climate finance are we going to start talking about climate debt and get more countries into climate debt and that again can not just thinking about about it in a global context but even bringing it home so to, thinking about what Keith was talking about with which was like um the air source heat pumps every home having an air source heat pump in Scotland and that's on the agenda of the Scottish government at the moment right but again who can afford it right and for those that can't afford it does that mean they have to take out finance and get themselves into debt to get air source heat pumps you know, so these are the real concerns, the real life everyday concern is about how much is it going to cost, especially when we think about the cost of living that's rising in the UK, but also globally. It's like, well, and, and it's a comment that somebody, Kirsten, made um, in the chat that I'd like to just quickly address now, is that why is sustainability such a middle class lefty concern? Well, most of the time it's a middle class concern because the middle class already have and that they can then sustain their lifestyles to a more greener, sustainable lifestyle. And it's where it's those that don't have then aspire, like Lucy was saying that, well, what are the road models in life? Everybody wants to aspire to be better. So even like the developing countries aspire to be like the global West because they already have, and they want to also have. So it's like, how do we change that kind of mindset and that global thinking about well, what is it that we're all aspiring to be? Thank you very much, Serena. Um, one, before I open it up, one last question for me, a question that's very close to my heart, having spent two years just writing about viruses. Um, it sort of, it, it struck me during uh, COVID that this is in a sense, a, a similar problem uh, that preys on similar human weaknesses. Um, there was there plenty of times where there was a benefit to acting early when things didn't seem so bad because that meant it cost less uh, in lives and money than acting late a lot harder when things were bad. Um, do you, uh, I'll, I'll go, go to Keith first, um, do you draw hope uh, from our response to COVID, from the amazing technologies, from the fact that we've sort of got through it to an extent, or, or are you depressed by 200,000 dead in the UK to achieve that? I'm very depressed by that bit. I mean, I think, yeah, we could, yeah, Tom, you've covered this uh, in great detail for, for two years, so we could, we could spend the rest of the time and more discussing all of the sort of policy failings and policy successes. I think failings are um, more numerous than some of the successes, but I think it does show the potential for human ingenuity. It does show the potential for us to change the way we do things. But linking back to some of the things we've talked about already, you know, we, many of us, not everybody, and this is, we kind of, kind of pick up that point about, you know, last lefties, whatever, you know, some of us have had, have the luxury of being able to work from home. Other people, their jobs prevent that, you know, don't allow that. You've got to get out and be, be exposed to various, various, you know, real, real serious threats, as, as uh, well, especially at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, but we, you know, many of us could change the way we did things, and yeah, it has its challenges, but we do it, you know, and then, you know, energy use reduced, you know, the, the, the streets were quieter, I think much nicer in many ways, um, you know, less less pollution, any kind of positive signs there, but, you know, the capacity to change change what we do. And I think we can, we can hold on we can hold on to that. I'd be afraid of the idea that some kind of technical solution is suddenly going to turn up to solve all our problems. I mean, you know, it's amazing the way that kind of uh, you know, these vaccines did turn up really quickly, but they were based on research that had gone back actually a number of years. So they weren't just coming out of nowhere. And uh, this is true of so many technologies that actually take often you know, decades developed. The technologies that are going to help us to change uh, you know, the way we do things across, across the whole economy, they already exist. Yes, uh, innovation can help to reduce the cost or to make the performance better or to use more sustainable materials and so on, and that's all, you know, all good stuff. But um, we should not pretend that we can just wait for some, you know, some unicorn to turn up and save the day for us. And the other big lesson is about preparedness. I think there's a big lesson for you know, adaptation, being ready for the impacts of climate change that are coming. We, we should not wait, we need to get ready now. 
Um, Lucy, what, what, what are your thoughts? What lessons, if anything, would you take from COVID? I think one of the most positive things that came out of the pandemic was how science was cool again and people were willing to listen to experts with a, a laser pen and, and a slideshow every night to say say what they should do and, and, and how suddenly we all realised actually we do need experts, we, we want reassurance, we want the people who know what they're talking about to be in charge. So I think that was fantastic and I really hope that we can have the same for climate. I, I do think that is happening a little bit but um, yeah, so I, I hope that continues. One thing that I'm concerned about that, that I think could potentially be a negative outcome of, of, of COVID in, in terms of thinking about the climate is there's this kind of co-opting of the narrative that what all us net zero freaks want is for everyone to be living like it was COVID times again. So we're not traveling, we're not going anywhere, we're kind of living these miserable small lives with no flights, nothing um, that we enjoyed. Uh, and and, and I, I worry that we don't want to let the narrative end up like that, where actually what we need to do to tackle climate change is to live like we did in the pandemic, because nobody wants to live like that. And uh, as Keith said, that lifestyle was only available to those who had the types of jobs that we all have, where we can sit at home. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's um, th there's things to learn and there's things to do better next time. But in, in general, it was fantastic to see science being listened to again, and I hope that can continue. Serena? Oh God, I'm going to be the cynical one here. <laughs> I'm going to talk about other negatives. All right. Um, so I think first thing that was really just fresh like circular economy is is at the heart of a lot of the work that I do. Um, and it was things like the reduction of plastic and the reduction of waste and recycling. I think we've got to just before COVID, we as a society were getting to this place where there were and even policies, there were policies getting put into place about single-use plastic. That all went down the bin. It just all went to haywire. Like even the recycling centres shut down. Even some of the recycling centres are still not fully recycling. You know, so all that hard work that you know people have been doing around waste and recycling, I think, took a really back step. Right? We were produced. We might not be producing because we weren't consuming as much. Um, but I, I think there were things that went drastically wrong for the environment um, during COVID. Um, and then the other thing, I think it was that narrative that we're all in it together was something that I found really um, quite didn't sit right for a lot of people because we might all be in, this, in the same storm, but we were definitely not in the same boat. So again, it's just being aware of some of the narratives that were coming out of COVID. Um, and yeah, is that was the two things that I found very, very negative during COVID. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Um, I think we're now we've we've had a lot of good questions. Um, I think we're going to start to go to them. Please, uh, there's, that's no reason for people to not ask more questions. Um, but we'll kick them off with, with a question from Jennifer Welsh, and I think probably Lucy have got this because it's something that you mentioned. Um, uh, slightly touched on the artificiality of the 1.5, the binariness of it, but what, what Jennifer Wells says is the world will still be here even if world temperature rises beyond 1.5. Um, it's uh, human and other species extinctions likely to occur, I think probably, I mean, I think probably it'd be a bit higher for humans. Um, but do we need to change the way that we talk about this? Are these sort of single targets useful? Uh, I'll start my answer by saying I do not think that humans are going to go extinct um, at all. There is no scenario that says that's the case unless uh, we do it to ourselves through some other thing that isn't the climate crisis. Um, so, so I'll start by saying that. But yeah, I mean, other species, we, you know, we the rate of extinction that we're causing to other animals is um, stressingly high, and, and and that is a real problem. Um, do we need to change the narrative? It's a really good question. I do think I am concerned about what happens in uh, a few years time when we breach that 1.5 degrees because we're going to and we will temporarily breach that in the next decade. I'm concerned when that happens that people will say it's over, we can't do it, you know, there's no point. And I think as you know, reflecting on what I said earlier, if I thought there was no point then I, I wouldn't get up and do my job every day. The, you absolutely have to believe that there is lots that we can still do. 
So do we need to change the narrative? Perhaps we need to talk more realistically about the fact that the future is nuanced, the future is unknown, the future is in our control, and it's not going to be that we'll just fall off a cliff and the human race will go extinct in 12 or 11 years time now. Um, we have a series of progressively worse futures, but we can have a series of progressively better futures too. And we know that once we start reducing the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that our climate will stabilize. So it's not, we don't have to have this kind of permanently hot, horrible world. A lot more is in, in our control than we think. And so I think that's the narrative that I would like to see coming out a bit more, a, a bit more of a positive one, not to be a, too much of a kind of techno optimist. To, I've had that accusation leveled at me before. Um, but I, you know, I do think we need to have slightly more positive narrative coming in there. Zarina, you put, you put up your hand. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, and I, no, I agree with Lucy that we should have positive narratives, but at the same time, that we can't ignore that lives are being lost because of climate change and the impacts of climate change. I mean, if we look at India and Pakistan, I mean, the temperatures there at the moment are like 55 degrees and lives are being lost. And um, right around the globe, there's lives lost every day because of climate impact. So, yeah, as, as, a, as a human race, we might not get extinct, but there are lives that are being prematurely, prematurely lost. So we do need to have that bit of urgency. We do need to think about climate change in terms of human lives and um, and other inhabitants of the planet. Yeah, um, Keith. Um, I mean, if we're being honest, I, I haven't. We still talk about well, keep 1.5 alive and all this. I haven't actually talked to anyone sort <laughs> of sentient who believes we have a hope in hell of staying under 1.5 and I, th I think in terms of breaching it we'll breach it for quite a long time and getting under it will require technologies we simply don't have i mean is this something that as lucy said we should prepare people for or are you in fact hopeful that we can stay under it no those are really really good points um i think what's it the ipcc in its you know its fixed assessment report you know the things that have been coming out over the last months I think it said with you know, its, its most optimistic scenario is that we, we go above 1.5 and then we come back. I think we can, in the optimistic scenario, we can come back quite quickly. But as Lucy said, you know, we're, we're going we're to breach it. It's very unlikely we will stay completely within within that 1.5. Uh, so so you, you're probably right that the narrative does need to change a bit because, as, again, as Lucy said, you know, ev every tenth of a degree counts in terms of the difference it makes. The impact on the planet, and as we were saying, these impacts are right now. So yeah. the effort has still got to be there. But but you know, it, it, you're right that the idea that we kind of you know temperature rise goes above one point five, and that's it, we're all doomed, and we give up now. I mean, that's completely the wrong sort of message. Uh, I think having a clear target helps in terms of focusing minds and focusing efforts on what we're trying to get to. Um, but and, and we, and we I, you know, it, I think it is not too early to give up on 1.5. I think, I think, I think, you know, the COP26, uh, you know, the president's right to try and keep it alive because every day, because every tenth of a degree counts. You know, we, we can get, we can get very close to it, and we still need to do everything we can to to achieve that. You know, the cost of the mitigation measure of reducing emissions far outweighs the kind of negative consequences of failing to emissions. So it's, it's something we've still got to do, even if, yeah, perhaps as we've just discussed, there's a bit of a bit of a challenge to exactly how we sort of frame the narrative. Yeah, yeah. And Keith, I think the next question is probably best to start with you, um, which is, and this is, I suppose, as much a geopolitical question now as an environmental question. Um, this is from Ronnie in Dumfries. Um, what could the UK and Scotland do to provide an independent and secure supply of fuels? Um, and Ronnie says fuels, I guess fuels themselves are an interesting bit, but I guess more broadly energy as well, um, without having a negative effect on the climate. Yeah, well, I mean, we've got this enormous potential in, in the UK for uh, renewables, you know, based on, based on weather, so wind and solar, but a certain amount of, of hydro capacity as well. We want to make full use of them. I mean, the extent to which it's complemented by other technologies is still open to debate. But one of the things we've definitely got to deal with is, of course, the variability of wind and solar resources. 
So if we build, you know, the 50 gigawatts of offshore wind farms that uh, British Energy Security Strategy talks about uh, very recently, uh, we will have times when we will have a, a you know a, a big surplus of electricity from renewable sources relative to the demand for electricity at that moment in time. You know, we won't be able to use all of it at that moment. The ability to use that surplus, we can export it to our neighbours, uh, or to change the time at which we do things such that we can kind of, you know, adapt uh, when when when, uh, when when we charge our vehicles or wash our clothes or whatever to when it's windy and sunny. That helps a lot, but it only helps a bit actually. It doesn't doesn't get the whole way there. So then I think you know the question for Ronnie about fuels. I think is is, is really interesting because we've got the potential to use this surplus to manufacture fuels, low carbon fuels that can be stored for the times when it's not windy and sunny and also for use in applications where you haven't got access to a wind farm. You can't get the wires there, you know, um, you know lorries, ships, aircraft depend on uh, sort of you know, concentrated energy dense, you know, quite relatively lightweight uh, stores of fuel that can carry around with, or carry around with them. But also, we can store these, you know, the energy through to, the, you know, like I say, the, the days when it's not not so sunny and windy. Different ways of doing that, uh, but hydrogen looks like one of the kind of mechanisms. And then you get into all sorts of debates about exactly how much we use hydrogen across across the economy. Uh, but certainly, it, it, you know, there's it's definitely in my mind a, a, a massive role for it. Quite how big? Open for discussion. Well, perfect, you know, it, it costs energy to manufacture the hydrogen and then turn the hydrogen back into yeah. But yes, that allows us to, to have a self-sufficient, self-contained energy system where we can get the, you know, use the renewables, put them into sort of forms of storage or other, other types of fuel that we can then use uh, at the time when it's waste. Yeah, yeah. Um... Lucy and Zarina, do, do you put up your hands if you have anything you feel you want to add to that? Otherwise, we'll move on to the next question. Maybe the next question for Zarina then. Um, oh, uh, Keith, Keith. Sorry, I'll just, about... yeah, I'll just add a quick thing on that. Yeah, okay. Sorry, special, chosen specialist subject. You know. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting thing that I think I think come up in the last you know, week or two, a report in the news that, that um, at Norway, which has got fantastic hydro resources, might be rationing its exports of the electricity to its neighbours. So over the last 20, 30 years, we've been building these interconnections where we can share our surpluses and deficits and smooth things out over time. Uh, so, you know, we've got lots of wind wind energy, so actually we, we can help the Norwegians to conserve their water resources, actually. They don't need to you know, generate the hydroelectricity when it's, when it's windy here, we can export our surplus to them. And in turn, we can use their hydroelectricity when it's not so windy and sunny here. So that's something that's actually has come up in the in the news in the last week or two. Actually, sorry, I know that this is this is going to be Keith heavy, but I, I have one question I've always wanted to have an answer to, um, with, uh, relating to energy things like that. Which is why haven't um, I don't know Morocco, Algeria. Uh, put a really big cable to Europe and just fill their useless desert with solar panels, which is there the cheapest way of generating electricity. You know, w w why aren't they already doing that? I think I think the simple answer is probably funding. Uh, and Lucy is going to come up with another answer as well. But uh, there have been projects that have proposed it, you know, quite serious projects, come to quite advanced stages in terms of you know, the engineering, for example, of the cables under the Mediterranean. Or there's a project that's on the, on the table now. I can't remember who the backer is. Proposing to bring a cable from North Africa just all the way to Britain without going through you know, the main continent of Europe. Um, so the ideas have been there. I guess, I guess you know, sometimes it's also a kind of geopolitical uncertainty. You know, and we're seeing this now in respect of imports of gas from, from Russia, not to draw an analogy with quite what, uh, what the regime is like there. But you know, there, are, there are these kind of elements of nervousness about uh, I imports from regimes that um, might be perceived as being unstable or where you're not quite sure about the kind of actual firmness of things. Yeah, Lucy. I, I guess I just wanted to uh, pick up on the useless desert <laughs> phrase <laughs> because, um, so I, I do a bit of research into, into land use and the kind of various benefits and trade-offs and a lot of that kind of thinking of kind of empty, unproductive land was why we now have a devastated upland in the UK that's just 
they call it they use the phrase sheep wrecked uh, it used to be lovely carbon sequestering peatland and temperate rainforest and that's close cropped grass and covered in sheep so i guess i'm not an expert on desert landscapes but i think we do need to think carefully about what else those, what other benefits those landscapes might be providing in terms of livelihoods and biodiversity before we kind of use them for renewable energy um but it's uh, it, it may be that yeah covering them in solar panels is the right way forward in terms of the overall benefits of the climate but i think it's a, it's an interesting question yeah yeah fabulous um well uh that's is something wrong oh serena okay yes brilliant yeah and it's just to respond to that as well because that useless desert bit also it hit a nerve with me as well uh, and it's also to remember that that useless desert might look useless in the West, but however, for somebody living in Morocco, that might be the part of their culture and their heritage, and for nomads, that could be their home as well. So it's just thinking about what the, what use that desert is to other people. I, I am duly chastised, and um, <laughs> uh, in fact, this this leads uh, use. I, I'm educated, uh, and that leads us into the next question, which is a question from Betsy King, and I think probably Zarina can take that. Uh, how important do you consider the role of education to be in relation to sustainability and climate change? Yeah, I think definitely we need to have um, sustainability in our education system, and um, we need to really have a, like a reform of the education system because I think one of the, our education system, one of the flaws is is how it feeds into a competitive narrative and what success looks like and success is based on materialistic things rather than looking at success based on like sustainability. So it's giving from a very young age an alternative view of what the world could look like and what we as society could be like as well and i think sustainability has um, a definite place in the education system from from a very young age right up into higher education as well because sustainability even in higher education is is not featured very highly um, and and within community education as well so there's different layers of education and recognizing and valuing what education is is also um, an important part because there are like cultural heritage knowledge that can be used within the in the formal education system as well that can actually help promote sustainability. Yeah, yeah. Fabulous. Um, unless either Keith or Lucy have... Oh, Keith? Yeah, I mean, the simple answer to the question is how important? Very. And uh, yeah, I mean, the, the Serena's right to kind of challenge any of us involved in education as to what, what we're doing to, to address it. And, uh, so, that, you know, I've got colleagues at you know, the University of Strathclyde, I've got colleagues who are working very hard and making sure that actually it's not, it's not just about, you know, climate issues, but a whole kind of broader set of issues around sustainability and so the sustainable development goals, you know, which is, you know, touching on some of the things we were talking about just now about, you know, culture and livelihoods and environment and so on. That, you know, th th these, these things are touched upon. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm an electrical engineer, I, I, I teach in an electrical engineering department. And it's absolutely essential that the engineers we are educating are aware of this broad set of potential societal impacts and benefits. It's both, and it's very difficult to have anything that doesn't have some kind of adverse impact. Of course, we're seeking the benefits and trying to get the balance right and how it plays out across you know, the range of the sustainable development goals, and it becomes just a natural way of thinking about how we do, in our case, how, how we do engineering. So uh, we're, we're working on it. Uh, we're not there yet. There's still, still progress to be made in terms of making sure that the, the, you know, the educational framework is right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the ne next question is, I think, extremely pertinent to all of this, which is we're going into a global slump. We're, cert we're certainly going into a uh, UK slump. Um, the economic outlook is pretty bad. Uh, I think if you look at What's going on in sections of the Tory party, the, the, the idea of net zero is now being seen very much as a socialist indulgence. Um, so there's a question from Cassie, uh, which is, how do you see the current economic situation impacting climate action from government and business? Uh, there's been talk about removing green levy from energy bills and lots of businesses tightening their belts. How, how do we square this? How do we keep climate action happening and amid this economic crisis? And I think maybe Lucy, if we start with you on that. It, yeah, it, it, it's really interesting. And I would love to see data on what happened to climate action during the previous recessions that we've had. I, I actually don't know what the answer is there. Um, 
So if anyone has a paper on that, please send it my way. Um, I think, yeah, I, I, to be honest, I think a lot of the chat amongst the Tory leadership uh, at the moment is um, a bit of a smokescreen. I'd, I, I'd be astonished if we backpedaled that much on the climate leadership that um, Boris Johnson did show um, for all of his faults. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm not too worried about it. I think we actually have an opportunity in tackling the cost of living crisis, particularly when it comes to energy, to kind of kill two birds with one stone. Um, in that if we become less dependent on fossil fuels, we are reliant on then building up our own energy system, as Keith talked about earlier. So actually, it's, it, it's a win-win. Um, I think the bigger concern for me is that, and there's been some conversation in the chat about it, is that a lot of the solutions that a household can do to lower its energy bills at the moment are only available to those who can afford the outlay of getting solar panels or getting a heat pump or getting an electric vehicle, etc. So I think that's my concern is it will slow down the uptake of those things without government investment. Um, but I, I, I think we're, um, I think the train is running and I think it would take a lot to kind of completely stop it. Um, but as I said, I, I, I don't know what has happened to climate action in previous recessions. And so that would be really interesting to, to see and to find out. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, one thing, spe speaking personally, well, one thing that I find interesting is that yes, the UK has um, ha has shown leadership in climate, but one of the things that happens, it feels like we often have this debate in the absence of acknowledging that other countries are doing things as well. Um, you know, we, 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 we talk about, you know, what are we doing going for net zero when China's busily building coal plants? And of course, China is building coal plants, but it has also, as I understand it, pledged that from 2030, its emissions are going to go down and by 2060 it's, it'll be net zero but this seems entirely absent from the UK debate where it feels like we're we're doing this sort of futile loan dash towards a, a target no one else is going for um but Keith what do you think how um you know how, how's the recession going to impact on things yeah it's going to be very difficult to tell um because this seems to be kind of an unusual recession in that you know there are these sort of supply side traits that are kind of slowing everything down. I mean, uh, have to see how that how that plays out. It's kind of different from what we were expecting. Those when we were in, in you know in, in the the, you know, the the worst periods of, of the COVID crisis. But I think, as Lucy said, it, it ought to be a boost for climate action because the relative cost of low carbon energy is so much lower now because the alternative, high carbon energy, is so expensive. Uh, but the challenge then, again, as Lucy said, it's sort of the, 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 you know, the, the profile of the cost is different. You know, there's this big upfront cost, but then your savings accumulate over time. So it's difficult to finance it, uh, as well as a sort of you know, relative nature of, of, a, of a change. You know, driving an electric vehicle, depending on what kind of mileage you do, if you can afford the car in the first place, then you know it's it's cheaper on average. You know, you're kind of per, per mile because because the electricity and the kind of efficiency of the vehicle is so much better. Cheaper electricity and the, and the energy efficiency is so much better than a combustion engine. But it's, it's, getting, it's getting that up, you know, it's, as Lucy said, meeting that up from cost, and not everybody can, can afford. And, you know, one of the things in the chat about, you know, about homes and, and people, private rented accommodation, you've almost got nowhere. So, I mean, there's a whole, whole raft of things they've never dealt with for, for decades to do with uh, you know, private rented accommodation and, and how how affordable it is and uh, how energy efficient it is and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, it, as I said, it, because because high, a high carbon lifestyle is so expensive now, it ought to really, all things being equal, boost the adoption of a low carbon lifestyle. Yeah. Um, the last question, which I'll go to Zarina for first, and if she has any thoughts on that other one, do do those as well. Um, it's a question from Keith Irving. Um, can the panel say what a just transition to a net zero economy means to them? So not just are we going to get to net zero, but are we going to do this in, in a just fashion? Yeah, as I spoke earlier on about this, um, I am concerned that, that our, our move to a net zero um, is not going to be just. In terms of just what I mean by it, it's not going to be fair, it's not going to be equitable. We're not bringing along everybody. And again, relating it back to the last question, I think that 
we could like the cost of living is so high at the moment that this could be a great lever to think about the climate debate in a low carbon but a low cost lifestyle right and it's thinking about well what is a low cost lifestyle but without without making people feel that they have to do without because i think previously a lot of people when they think about um a low carbon lifestyle they think that they have to do without but it's giving people alternatives that are low carbon but are cost effective as well and i think that's what's really important about a just transition it's like who are we having uh, when we talk about net zero but who is this net zero for is it just for the country to meet its targets or is it for the people of the country and if it's for the people of the country, then we're having a different discussion and we're talking about a just transition. And we're talking about making livelihoods for everybody much more fairer, equitable and accessible. And I think we have to keep that at the heart of all kind of negotiations. It's really important. Yeah, yeah. Um, Lucy, uh, yes, your, your thoughts on this and also maybe at the same time, because I think they're pretty closely linked, there's a question from Beverly, which is uh, what might be the key government actions needed to bring communities together towards positive climate action and away from individualism and consumerism, if indeed that is something you want to do. They, they, they feel quite linked. So give me your thoughts on either, both, one, the other. Um, yeah, the, the, the first, I was just going to pick up and say no transition in the history of the human race has been just. If we think about the Industrial Revolution that got us into this mess. That wasn't just lots of people got left behind if we think about the agricultural revolution before that that wasn't just it often just fed the kind of leaders of society and left other people much worse off so i think it's not unique to the climate crisis and i think the fact that it's even being talked about as on the same agenda is really really good and other than that i totally agree with with what zarina said um to tackle the second question tom you must have read my master's degree dissertation because it was all about Community ownerships. <laughs> um, so yeah, I um, absolutely. I, I've done a bit of work with communities who want to take climate action, and the number one thing that I learned from that is that first of all, having this kind of central target to galvanise around. So in this case, it was a community who wanted to buy out some land to plant a woodland. Really got everyone thinking in a community-minded way, and really brought people out of their shells and out of their kind of individual uh, focuses. Uh, to head towards this target. So actually having a goal like that is super important for communities. But the number one thing that they asked for was that the government didn't make it so damn hard to do. It relied on a number of passionate, motivated uh, retirees who had time on their hands to be able to drive it forwards. It was like a series of never ending obstacles to kind of get funding to make it happen and to bring everyone together. So I think if, if we want to see more communities doing things like this and kind of, yeah, developing that community spirit, um, if it is a specific project that they need funding for, that needs to be made much easier. Um, and, and, and that's where the government can help. And actually, the Scottish government is doing quite a bit around that, particularly when it comes to land. Um, so, yeah, good, great, great question. Thanks, Beverly. Uh, Keith, do you have thoughts? Yes, you do. You've got a hand up. Yeah, I want to yeah, chip into this. I mean, I think, you know, the, back to the, you know, the first question, what, what is a just transition? For me, it's one in which the costs and the benefits are shared fairly. In kind of you know my very simple definition of it but you know in practice it's much harder to achieve when you get down to you know real real policies so for example in scotland you're going to have to face up to what happens to the oil and gas industry uh, and as we've already talked about uh, how do we enable those choices those options of, of you know having a heat pump in your home or uh, need a, if you need a car you can have an electric car and, and be able to rely on it so on so it's great to uh, you know, it's quite easy to express as a very simple kind of you know catch line but it's very difficult to implement but it has to be done otherwise we're not going to retain public support and uh, um, and you know, but, but even though the industrial change is, as, as Lucy was saying is very hard to manage as industries grow and others contract there are winners and losers we have some real policy challenges I've got a lot of sympathy with the policy makers who've got to make the decisions on that I do slightly worry about the language, actually. Um, so again, it's maybe picking up. There was a point that was made earlier about you know middle class lefty concerns, or not just middle class, but you know, justice is a concept that means actually quite a lot of things to different people. And you know, Serena has set out you know a lot very very well 
and I, I, I sign up to, to a lot of that, I, I think. I'm, I'm quite comfortable with it for me, but there is a part of the political spectrum that, that doesn't like that language. I'm, I'm pleased that Alok Sharma, in this, as a top president, has used the language of just transition. That's, that's really good. But a lot of his uh, you know, members of the same political party don't. You, know, you don't find that term at all in the net zero strategy. Whereas, on the other hand, I think there's lots of buy-in to this idea of fairness. I think, I think everybody can relate to that and everybody can feel that it's a really important kind of feature. Uh, so I think it's, it's still important we retain the political consensus that still largely exists. I mean, Tom, you were talking about you know, parts of the Conservative Party earlier. But as far as I understand, the majority of the Conservative Party are still in favour of climate action. So let's, let's make use of that level of political consensus across, across the spectrum. Make sure that the costs and the benefits are shared fairly and we do achieve this transition to a low-carbon society. Yeah. For the last question, and thank you very much for your time, um, all of you. Um, the, the last question before I get you all to, and maybe start thinking about this as well, to sum up in a minute what, what you think we've, we've learned what's pertinent. But before that, uh, Kimberley in Edinburgh is making you, and I paraphrase, a dictator um, of the country or perhaps even the world. Um, you have the power to do one thing right now for an urgent result. Um, so what would that be? What, what would you do? You can ride over all democratic processes and do one thing. Uh, and uh, let's go to uh, Zarina first. Oh, God, no, not me. <laughs> um, God, what would I do? Oh, I would probably want to have a reform, uh, like a people's revolt, um, yeah, a people's revolution, and think about our whole political system and think, well, what is our political system? What is it feeding into? Change the power dynamics. Yeah, I think I would want a people's revolution. Excellent. So your dictatorship will create a lasting dictatorship. <laughs> Keith, what about you? Very difficult, isn't it, to narrow it down to one thing. All of us have got you know, very long shopping lists of things that we think need to happen. And I think a very positive things to happen, actually. They're not, you know, it's not just about hair shirts and stuff, not at all. I think the points that we see are really, really important. We can have an enjoyable, healthy lifestyle. Um, the, and the point Zarina made about you know, changing a political system, I, mean, I, I found it really interesting looking at what some of the climate assemblies have been doing and the way of getting engagement and decision making. I mean, but in one sense, you know, the idea of few people coming and taking time on behalf of the rest of us to think seriously about issues and, and get information from the experts and then make a, make a judgment on behalf of the rest of us. But, hey, isn't that what the Parliament is supposed to do? Anyway, think. Kind of more kind of pragmatically, as me as a kind of an energy system background, so just to pick one thing, I think I would try to make sure, we'll try to help us to be more efficient in our use of energy. Uh, so, you know, in our homes, in the way we move about, I mean, that also comes down to some things we can do, the way things are made. But, um, yeah, I think, I think that's a very immediate thing we should be getting on with. And Lucy? Oh, dear, my answer is much less uh democratic uh i would invest really really heavily in carbon removal to stabilize our climate and then move on to uh and bring serena and keith onto my dictatorship panel and uh invest in uh community assemblies and 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 forming a new people's revolution but after we've stabilized the amount of carbon in the atmosphere and got it back down to a, a livable level <laughs> Well, I, I, I'm going to maintain a Mugabe-style dictatorship for myself. I'm absolutely not bringing the people in. But I think I, I would possibly, and this is going to uh, cut me out as, as maybe maybe naive, maybe overly utopian, I would invest heavily in fusion. It feels to me like it has gone from being a fundamental scientific problem to an engineering problem. And as we saw with things like the Apollo missions, you can brute force those. So I find it utterly flabbergasting that we're not just brute forcing the problem and then when we have our fusion we can get all of our carbon sucking devices and i can maintain my lovely western lifestyle without having to worry about the hippies in the people's assembly um <laughs> but, uh, uh, that's that's my I, I've, I've successfully alienated the audience now but it doesn't matter because we're coming to an end um, as we come to the end um could i ask each of you as, as i warned to maybe have a sort of a minute closing statement um and the roulette wheel of doom will fall on Keith. 
the roulette wheel of doom. But I want to counter that message of doom, I think. It's the main kind of closing message. I think uh, you know, there are lots of benefits that come from tackling climate change, from you know, reducing emissions, uh, being kind of adapted to, to, to the climate change that's, that's already happening. Lots of benefits for us locally, lots of benefits for people across the planet. And we can do it. I really believe we can do it. You know, the, 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 I mean, yeah, if we've got the fusion energy that, that works uh, you know, safely, reliably, um, we can deal with it. I mean, there is still a bit of radiation involved, as I understand it, but, you know, if we can deal with all of that, then great, that's fantastic. But we have technologies even now that, that do work. We, we can do this. They have to be made to work for people, as, as Zarina and Lucy were saying earlier. And, uh, and, and, and that means making it affordable and making the choices easily available and accessible. So that's, that's a collective endeavour, I think. Lucy? Yeah, I would summarise with, with a similar message of, um, of optimism. I think um, when I was in school, we were still debating whether global warming, as it was called, was caused by humans or not. Um, and now, it, you know, we, we've kind of made a lot of progress on that and it's unanimous and young people today are demanding much more action. So we, we know that change can happen really quickly. As I said before, what I'm concerned about is that um, anxiety overtakes us and, and that prevents us from taking action. So I think, yeah, I totally agree with Keith. I think it's definitely within our grasp and that we have a, a moral duty to, to make sure that we, we achieve it. And as Zarina said, you know, it's, it's already bad um, for people all around the world. So t time is of the essence. Um, and so we need to throw everything that we have at it. But ultimately, when we do that, we won't just have tackled climate change, but we'll have created a nicer world for us all to live in with greater biodiversity, nicer lifestyles, and, and more equality. So I think there's a lot to look forward to. Zarina. I think for me, it's hope. I always have to have hope, um, and I really should have hope. We have the technology, we have solutions, we have the will. We just now need people to come together. So that's people from all parts of society, including policymakers, decision makers, corporations, industry, to start to collaborate and think of this as a global issue for all of us, that we're all in it, we all need to solve it and come together. And that gives me hope. But if we start to compete with one another, we're not going to get there. Fabulous. Um, thank you all. Um, I will end with a very short, maybe sort of slightly, slightly more moderate uh, thought, which is I've been covering climate conferences since, as I said, since Copenhagen. Um, and since I started, everyone's been saying how rubbish and depressing climate conferences are. And they've sort of, to an extent, been absolutely correct. But in Copenhagen, going into Copenhagen, we were looking at worst case scenarios or in fact expected case scenarios on the basis of current emissions pledges of five six degrees going into paris i think it was four three and a half degrees and now i think coming out of glasgow it's 2.4 degrees obviously there's loads that needs to be done to make that work but i think that's an astonishing achievement for a very hard problem so um, Can everyone, uh, panelists are coming up. It's going so well. <laughs> <laughs> we had Tom sharing beautifully right up until that moment. And he disappeared. Uh, I'm sure his closing remarks were uh, very enlightening. Oh. Hello. I, I will just step in here from the Festival of Politics team because, as you're saying, um, it was going so smoothly until the last moment. Um, Tom was just, just wrapping up. Um, so I will, in his place, um, thank the panellists, uh, Keith, Lucy and Serena for their excellent uh, uh, contributions. Thank Tom in his absence. Um, he's maybe come back. Excellent. Tom, we lost you for a second. But I'll, I'll let Hello. you do the final bit. Um, Sorry, I, I, I apologise for that. I'm not, not sure what happened, um, but uh, I'm back. Uh, and just say thank you to our panel, uh, Dr. Keith Bell, Lucy Stansel Jenner, and Zarina Ahmed. Um, thank you, all of you, all of you in the audience, for uh, joining in. 
Um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to remind you that there are many more festival events taking place at the Scottish Parliament today and tomorrow, including a rehearsed reading from the National Theatre of Scotland and discussion about care experienced people in care, love and understanding. Uh, that's followed by the best-selling poet Lem Sisse talking about his memoir, My Name is Why. Other panels include Do You Trust Politicians and The State of the UK Union. I do hope you'll be able to join us. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.